We were scheduled to end at 3.50. Uh, we're gonna move that to four o'clock. Hopefully uh, we can stay on. Um, first of all, thank, thank you to all three of you. Uh, it, it's just so encouraging and we are so grateful that you've taken the time to talk with us. Uh, I want to uh, start with, with a very broad question that rolls in several of, of the issues that have been touched upon and several of the items that are in the Q&A. And it sort of relates to your last slide, Donna. Uh, it, it regards educated physicians, educated physicians. Uh, and the question is, is this, um, and actually I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ron Tompkins to, to address this first and, and assuming uh, David and Donna, you have things to add. The question is, um, what, is there such a thing as a CFS specialist? Uh, should primary care doctors expect to be able to make referrals to a specialist? Uh, or should they be being educated to manage care the way Donna has described? And uh, along the same token, um, Dr. Felsenstein, I'm sorry I call you Donna from time to time. You're more than welcome. Has been doing this since 1979 and I don't wanna speak for her, but uh, she's doing it in a big infectious disease clinic with lots of doctors, not a single one of whom has been helping. Uh, how is that going to change? So Donna, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, well, one, one thing, Phil, is um, it needs to change. And um, I think we're all committed to help make it change. Um, I think um, chronic fatigue is something that people are finally recognizing. You know, as when I started this in 1970, to do this in 1979, it was myself and Anthony Kamaroff over at the Brigham who were involved in this and really nobody else in our area. Um, Dr. Tompkins is here, is Dr. Sistrom, Dr. Kara. We're working with um, Peter Novak, Dr. Farhad as neurologists. So this has actually grown within our own um, hospital system where we're looking, we're working potentially with people at BI Deaconess Medical Center. So there is now an interest and we are putting together a cohort of people to do this, but you're right, that is not enough and more needs to happen. And one of the things we need to do is to start off in medical school and in nursing school to educate people that this is a real illness. Um, and that is where it has to start so that people coming out of their education um, want to help and want to understand this and want to go into research to do this. Um, and I think that can happen. Um, I think the other thing that is happening, um, and I mentioned this, this to you earlier uh, when we spoke, um, we're all um, dealing with COVID-19 right now, the pandemic. Um, it's very little to find a silver lining in at times um, probably all the time, <laughs> but the one silver lining is um, that I think out of this is, un unfortunately out of this is going to come tremendous research and people who are interested in this. Um, we are seeing long haulers with COVID-19 um, and we, as Dr. Tompkins has already mentioned, it is an opportunity to try to see people when the infection starts and understand what happens over time. And there are many people in the infectious disease unit and in the uh, critical care groups in pulmonology who I sit on um, uh, every twice a week, there are these meetings where they are listening to this, they're looking at it, they're trying to understand it. So people are coming together to do this. And I think research will come out of this. I've gotten multiple emails over these months of people who have patients who wanna understand this and are interested in working in this area. So I think this will come. So do yeah. you Do you imagine or do you believe at present that you are or there is such a thing as a MECFS specialist? And if so, uh, how should uh, primary care physicians um, educate themselves? To what level should they educate themselves? And at what point should they be making a referral? 
Um, that's an excellent question, Phil. Um, there are people who say that, who consider themselves chronic fatigue specialists. And I guess, you know, I started infectious disease. Why am I doing this? Because I think it starts with an infection or many or one or many different infections with a particular outcome. Um, and, and that's how I got into it. Um, but I'm not enough. I need the rheumatologist. I need the cardiologist. I need people to, um, I need Dr. Sistrom. So there, we need to have a variety of people who work together. When we have the neuropathy, what do we do about it? Do we give them intravenous immunoglobulin to see if we can quiet the nerves down and help the nerve heal? So we need specialists to come together to come up with uh, care. It has to start though with the primary care provider. Okay, because there are many people out there and not enough hands. So it has to start with the primary care provider. They have to be educated and we need to give them the tools so that in the 20 minutes when they have an intake with a patient, they can hear and know how to hear what the patient is saying, know to bring the patient back and know to start an evaluation and then learn when to refer. I don't, I hope I'm answering your question, Phil. Well, let me, you are, let me follow up on that and, and hopefully we can get some thoughts from Dr. Tompkins and Maybe David Sistrom. Um, you know, Leah mentioned early on that we do referrals here. We we counsel really roughly 200 people a year who come to us saying any number of things uh, and they need a doctor. And in the last two months alone, we've had nearly a dozen requests from other doctors, nurses, social workers, including from major facilities like the Mayo Clinic. They're coming to us to say, uh, can you, um, can you refer us to a CFS specialist? Um, you know, what we'd like to say is no, but we can refer you to the CFS clinic at Mass General. Uh, you know, we talked about this, this vision. Um, I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, Ron Tompkins, do you, do you imagine the, the uh, collaborative that you're working with now to, when it eventually becomes a clinic, is it something in which there will be a quarterback, let's say, for treatment who's making the kinds of referrals and monitoring the care that Dr. Felsenstein is describing? So let me answer your question first. Um, in, a, in a real center, uh, a, someone who specializes in uh, MECFS would be the wonderful quarterback. Uh, number one, as, as Donna was describing, uh, make the exclusionary diagnoses and on each primary care visit, being sure that something else hasn't creeped in that uh, is uh, treatable. Um, but uh, to speak to the larger question, uh, you know, uh, the army of clinicians who are going to be seeing these patients in their, uh, who are sitting out in their waiting room as primary care. And um, uh, I'm, I am concerned that uh, when you look at the demographics of patients that, that we're seeing, they're predominantly women and they're Caucasian. And, I, and as Donna said, uh, it's not restricted to sex or ethnicity, or you don't have to be American. And uh, so there's, a, in my opinion, there's very likely a sea of patients that are just being um, entirely missed at the moment. And the way our healthcare system is set up, that's, that's an issue for primary care. And so those of us who are knowledgeable in this field, we really need to spend quite a bit of our time coming up with tools that will help primary care not only identify these patients, but identify symptoms that are very serious and need to be followed up and give them the direction and the tools they need to provide the proper care for these individuals. And we, have, we both have this short-term problem where locally we're having a hard time uh, just providing care to those who are seeking it. But I'm deeply concerned that there's a huge sea of, of the patient community out there who have absolutely no idea what they have and are being uh, failed by a healthcare system. And I, I sincerely think that primary care uh, tools would be very important part of our research and education program. And I agree, we got to uh, include uh, nursing schools and medical schools, but uh, we also need to have put the tools together 
so that we, when we go with this education, that they have tools to actually address uh, these issues. Let me follow up. Do you see, or what would you see as the role for an association like ours, uh, Patient Education and Support Association, uh, the role for the collaborative, uh, or the role for other institutions in making this this uh, this change happen? You know, it goes from med school education, as you mentioned, to what's going to happen when COVID long haulers overwhelm the system. Who's who's got what role in in preparing us uh, for management? Um, well, I appreciate your association because I'm also on a weekly basis getting many, uh, they come to our website or they have somehow discovered our activities and they're asking for- Probably therapy. from us. <laughs> well, no, no, and, and I'm using you guys as a, as a referral base um, and, and because, uh, you know, we don't have the capacity for it. And so you are serving a, a marvelous function with respect to a resource to the community. But my uh, current sense is this, is this, is, this uh, activity is gonna expand. And um, I don't know how we can grow this, uh, but there is clearly significant need in the community. And we, it might come under incredible pressure with this post COVID long haul issue. Bill, David, may, may yes, I? please, please. So you, you talked about a war before. Yeah. And, and how do you start? And, you know, I think the first thing in this war is the education. And patients are sick. They don't often know what they have. They're told they're depressed. And I have patients who come to me after years of being on antidepressants and finally being given a diagnosis. This needs to be out there in the news. It needs to be out there on the talk shows. It needs to, the word needs to be out there for people. And we need to educate the medical providers. And that's our job to do that. I, you know, and it's, it's one of the things that is now on my, um, my to-do list is I'm trying to put together an education program for primary care providers at the Mass General Hospital in the Brigham. So it, that has to happen, but we need to get the word out to the public. And I appreciate everything that your organization is doing. I would say, let's do more. Um, and how can we get the word out there? How do we get on Oprah? How do we get on the other shows? How do people hear about chronic fatigue? That this is real. Thank you. Let's bring Dr. Sistrom into the, the discussion. Um, Dr. Sistrom, um, a few questions on, on PEM and Mestinon. Uh, one, can PEM be diagnosed without an invasive CPET? Two, can you comment on the mechanisms that explain PEM following mental exertion and also the mechanism that explain the delay, you know, 24, 48 hours delay. And then finally, this is the question that we have, we get asked lots. Um, do you foresee a time when Mestinon may be safely prescribed to an MECFS patient as a matter of course without undergoing the IC PET? Um, so all great questions. Um, just one second, Phil, to borrow from the uh, presidential debate the other night. Go back to, I want to go back to the original question just for two seconds. And, okay. um, you know, what, what do we have to do moving forward? And I totally endorse everything Ron and Donna just said. All I, all I would just add slightly, we've kind of said this already, one of the major barriers to getting the word out and educating in part patients, but also um, the, the infuriating naysayers among the healthcare providers is convincing them that this is a real disease. To do that, we need to understand mechanisms to do that. We need biomarkers that are readily obtainable, cheap, reproducible, um, because without that, we're never gonna convince the medical establishment that this is real and, um, and it's a, a big roadblock. So anyway, that's the prior question. 
So um, post-exertional malaise is a clinical diagnosis. It's not based on um, our, our invasive exercise testing or uh, there is um, there is the non-invasive replicate exercise test, which uh, can inform that a little bit though, the, um, uh, that has evolved and is actually been approved by the CDC as one of the quote biomarkers for ME. So you do a non-invasive test on day one, get a VO2 max and then document that that maximum oxygen uptake declines uh, at the time of the post-exertional malaise uh, symptoms. Uh, and that's a hard number. And um, so a depressed VO2 max the next day or two days later is, is useful, I think a useful adjunct. Uh, the mechanisms of PM, uh, we, we just don't know. So this is uh, going to be a little bit of conjecture, a little bit of science. Um, we have some preliminary data, uh, and this is part of the consortium's work uh, with the NIH that suggests that at least in a subset of patients with ME and PEM, uh, there is an exaggerated pro-inflammatory cytokine signature that is uh, evolved into, into the blood as a result of whatever provokes it. But in, in our case, it's, it's the acute exercise bout. Uh, it's exaggerated and, uh, and then uh, like a viral infection, um, uh, has a little bit of lag time and then uh, is associated with symptoms later. The, this is preliminary and this is something we are actively working on together along with some colleagues at NIH. Um, but it looks like um, it looks like it might hold up. Um, uh, with network analysis, it looks like there are hubs and spokes that are unique to ME provoked by acute exercise. We've not done this with other form, other th other um, provokers of PEM, such as emotional or uh, cognitive stress. Uh, my guess is there are similar pathways at play there. So um, that's one potential uh, one potential reason turning on the inflammasome in a delayed fashion uh, that then persists in a susceptible individual might be one explanation. Uh, quickly on mestinon. Um, I mean, one of the reasons we're doing the acute uh, prospective double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial is to put some teeth into all this, some science um, to determine, uh, at least in part, how it works. The acute mechanisms might not necessarily be the same as uh, the mechanisms underlying a chronic response. Uh, increased cholinergic tone may be good. It may be anti-inflammatory. It may help nerves. It may help mitochondria. Um, so more on that later. Right now, uh, our philosophy is that uh, we, with the invasive CPET at the Brigham, uh, like to determine uh, whether we have the dysautonomia pattern predominantly uh, versus an impaired oxygen extraction pattern that might suggest mitochondrial disease on the other hand. And we're trying to tailor the therapy toward the uh, more of the dysautonomia type ME patient. Um, ultimately, um, uh, maybe uh, empiric meston, I know others, including some in Boston uh, do that. And even I um, violate my own rule about getting the science and the medicine first before prescribing it, uh, because we've been, um, our lag time to do the exercise test, we've been overrun with, uh, with, with patients and uh, it's just, kind of unconscionable when we hear a strong dysautonomia type story um, to send somebody off for four months before their exercise test without trying to do something. So I think empiric mestinon off-label again, of course, um, uh, has its potential place. There, there certainly are doctors here in Massachusetts who, who do prescribe. Uh, Donna Felsenstein, what are your thoughts about that? About using mestinon? Yeah, without you know, without diagnostics, um, I have I I have used it, um, and and uh, I've discussed this with David because there is often a wait in order to get the testing done, and um, I think um, it is a it is a reasonably well tolerated drug. We start at very low doses, and and then move it move it up, and then when the patients do if they do decide to go ahead with the CPET, then not every patient wants to, um, um, but many patients will. 
Um, then we just stop the drug right before the CPET so that they can have a good test yeah. and get the information that's needed. And then they go back on. So um, I have done that clinically. Um, some patients um, have benefited from it before they've gotten to the CPET. So um, it, it's, it's hard to wait when someone isn't feeling well. Um, so as long as the downside of a drug is, li is, is limited, um, you have you don't ever want to cause harm, but with this drug, which is well tolerated, it's a reasonable thing to try. Great. Uh, let's um, switch gears. I'm going to take some questions from the chat box. Um, I think this goes uh, first to Dr. Tompkins. Uh, in the spring of 2019, Stanford, uh, Ron Davis's lab, uh, announced a breakthrough in the identification of a biomarker. Uh, where does that stand today? Um, well, uh, Dr. Davis would be the best to um, answer that, but so I, I'm uh, sort of a second hand uh, about it. Uh, he had described this nanoneedle and uh, in each of the patients with MECFS, it appeared that there, there were uh, consistently abnormal uh, results. Um, they have been continuing to do this assay um, and uh, it, uh, the, the OMF has actually continued to uh, support the development of, of the assay. Um, the individuals have, uh, who were primarily responsible are in one of the other uh, University of California uh, systems. Uh, it's, uh, right now, it's a bit of an engineering challenge uh, mm -hmm. to make the test more readily available and practical. Uh, uh, we would love to have the instrumentation at MGH to do um, uh, similar uh, testing for evaluation to figure out how sensitive and specific it might be. But technically, it's just not to that stage uh, yet. And I know that there's tremendous interest to develop it further, but um, I'm not aware that it has developed sufficiently so that it could be used at multiple different sites. I guess that's a long-winded answer, but. Okay, if it were developed, for those of us who don't know much about it, um, what has the nanoneedle been able to identify? What is the biomarker? And does it immediately translate into some possible treatment or is, is it a ways away? Uh, so just, just at a very high level description, right? let's say a, a poor man's description, um, it is the cellular response to a salt load. And so they're, they're your blood cells are sitting in a, in a salt solution. They add additional salt and the cells are, are not responding to this salt load in a normal fashion. And uh, to me, that's, it is specific in that there might be a metabolic or a molecular pathway for that. The extent to which it might be exclusive to MECFS is unclear to me at the moment. So um, is it a diagnostic that would be specific for MECFS? I can't answer that question yet. And we would love to have it in our hands to do exactly that. Uh, anything to add, uh, Dr. Felsenstein or Dr. Sistrom? No. Uh, I'm gonna stick with uh, Dr. Tompkins, you. Uh, sure. <laughs> Here's a question again from the chat. Um, based on your findings from I mean, your, your vast history and experience with trauma studies, uh, are there therapeutics that you have used that you think may be useful, maybe candidates for MECFS treatments? Uh, by, well, we do... Uh... What has been very dramatic in the field of injury is that uh, correcting the, the physical abnormalities that occurred with the injury, either surgically or uh, medically, um, improves the genetics and the proteomics dramatically. So uh, that in, in MECFS, the driver that's creating this abnormality, if you discover it, and, and treat the driver of the system, then you could 
that that would be a dramatic way of improving MECFS. Um, to get more specific, for example, uh, there's been a great deal of research in uh, trophic agents for muscle. Uh, we all, I hate to use the word fatigue because this disease, it, it, fatigue doesn't describe what the real problem is. It's, uh, it's far more than that. But there are, there are lots of drugs that are being developed for fatigue that are uh, of lesser degree, let's say with other chronic diseases, heart or pulmonary disease or others. Um, it, it has been a little bit disappointing because in, in general, they build up muscle bulk, but they do not uh, replace the muscle strength. And uh, I had hoped that that would be one possibility for development of, um, of this post-exertional malaise, but I expect that it's probably not gonna turn out. But the fact of the matter is we need to study the reparative mechanisms in this post-exertional malaise. It just doesn't seem like their muscles recover as quickly um, as a healthy response. And we really just need to learn more about where that deficiency is and uh, discover the pathways. And frankly, there are, there are many opportunities, I think, if we discover pathways that there'll be drug targets that we could use. So I'm, I'm very, help, I'm very uh, hopeful in this regard. And uh, I think it's just another example. We have a good sense of what's not working we did not know specifically of how it's not working. If we learn more about that in a systematic fashion, then we can develop drug targets and we can take advantage of, of off-label use of, of already drugs that are useful for those drug targets. So we just need to learn more about this. And so it's fundamentally an issue of research. Thank you. Uh, we've talked about uh, COVID-19 and MECFS. Um, uh, we all, if we, if those of us who may not know, uh, Dr. Avi Nath at NIH, uh, as well as Dr. Fauci are both on record in public comment indicating that uh, a subset of COVID long haulers will in fact go on to develop MECFS. Uh, and we've touched a, a little on that, but there's still a lot of, um, concern out there and, I think this question would go uh, to Donna Felsenstein. Um, are MECFS patients more susceptible to developing uh, COVID-19? With complications. Um, I don't think we know the answer to that, Phil. I, um, what I've, um, I, I think any infection, any illness, any stress that the patients get puts them down and they have to recover. And their time to recovery is going to be greater than any another person who's otherwise well. Um, and so I am concerned for the people that I work with and tell them to try to minimize their exposure so they're not infected. Whether or not there will be a higher percentage of complications in people with MECFS, I don't think we've seen that, um, which is good news. Um, you know, again, we don't have a lot of information about it, but I have not seen that. But we do have people who have a harder time to recover. So I've had a number of patients who have had COVID who have taken a tremendous amount of time to get past the ongoing fever, the ongoing fatigue, the worsening respiratory symptoms and so forth. But fortunately, no one in hospitalization yet. But again, we, we don't have that information. So. Pretty good. Uh, I, I think we, we can uh, stay on you for this, but I, I'm sure Dr. Sistrom will uh, have more to say, but let's start with you, Dr. Uh, Felsenstein. Um, can you talk about mitochondrial dysfunction or mitochondrial myopathy and whether there are in fact therapeutics for uh, this aspect or this comorbidity that we find in people with MECFS? Yeah, I actually wish Dr. Kara was here with us because she's really more of the mitochondrial expert um, than I am. And I actually may turn to David. Um, there, there are, um, over the years, we have used a number of um, drugs that we refer to as the mitochondrial cocktail um, with varying results. 
Um, but I, I don't know that we have the perfect combination yet. But David, do you want to take that one? And Well, I second, we don't have the perfect combination, Donna, that is for sure. Um, no, it, well, in my world, um, we believe that there is a subset of ME patients uh, who on that invasive CPAT actually have uh, way more profound uh, issues with muscle oxygen uptake and utilization than others. And this is anecdotal, but uh, I think there's a higher prevalence of symptoms, including um, myalgias, that's achy muscles related to exercise, um, maybe a longer history, um, not just two years post flu, but oh, when I was a teenager, I had issues and couldn't keep up with the other kids in gym. Th that that's at the level of um, anecdotes, but the poor oxygen extraction is real. And then the little bit of data that I showed you in my talk is what I've got. Um, I've had this discussion over coffee with Amel Kara, and I think um, she, I don't want to speak for her, but my take on her current thinking is that uh, she is open to the possibility that a subset of patients with ME have an acquired um, mitochondrial metabolism problem and muscle. Um, I have heard her say, so I think she'd allow me to quote her on this, that um, those patients respond roughly uh, to a degree half the time with a classic antioxidant mitochondrial vitamin cocktail. There are uh, drugs uh, in the pipeline that appear to be promising uh, in terms of um, well, they're, for lack of a better term, called mitochondrial stokers. They are drugs that appear to favorably affect um, mitochondrial metabolism. So I think as time goes forward, if we can, with the help of research money, identify patients with ME, a subset of patients likely, who have mitochondrial dysfunction uh, and, and embark on proper um, placebo controlled uh, prospective randomized studies of some of these promising drugs in the pipeline will know a lot more. It may be that the treatment may um, give us a window into what the original disease was uh, because these folks don't have genetic forms of mito disease. They're very hard to diagnose. So just back to sort of put a point on the question, um, your research clearly identifies, I don't know if it's clear, your research identifies certainly the strong possibility that there's mitochondrial dysfunction. And so the question is, are there ther ther therapeutics that you uh, use when, you're, when you have a subset of patients who, who present that way? Um, not, not routinely uh, yet. So um, I will, when I strongly suspect mito disease, and especially when there's a, a family history of mito disease, that clearly ups the ante, and I send them to a Mel uh, But yeah. moving, but moving forward, um, there are pending clinical trials that are under discussion of such drugs, uh, novel drugs that aren't FDA approved yet that clearly need um, to see the light of day of a, a real clinical trial. Okay, great. I have, uh, I'm going to just take the liberty to ask one more question and, and ask you to limit the answer to one minute each. So we have time for Leah to wrap up. And the question is this, um, if there's one thing that you would encourage our association to do to be able to better help you help us as patients, what would it be? How about we'll start with Ron Tompkins because you look the least stressed of the three of you. <laughs> well, I, I, I have to say I enjoyed 2018 when we were back in a more normal environment. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed working with your association. We had quite a number of public events, uh, uh, both for the community as well as for the, uh, we had a great one with uh, the uh, MGH Health Institute with a lot of uh, medical uh, personnel for education and awareness in the community. And I think you guys do a great job at that. 
And I think that, you know, to get, we have the medical piece to it and you guys have the community organization and we love that. Great, so more of that then. Definitely. Okay, uh, Donna. Um, I, I'm not sure I have the best answer, Phil. I have to think about that. I, um, I, I think um, helping us with getting the education to, to patients would be important. Um, helping uh, patients know where to go for information would be important. Um, having more symposium that the general public are invited to, um, I think would be helpful. So um, continuing support in those areas, I think would be great. The educational piece would be wonderful. Um, financial support, if possible, certainly to allow us to do what we need to do. Okay, and Dr. Sistrom? Yeah, I guess I would emphasize the, the last point Donna uh, made, and that's uh, fundraising for more research. Um, I don't, uh, the clinical side is unbelievably important, but at least given my experience and talking to other healthcare providers um, close to me and uh, not so close to me, is that um, there isn't buy-in out there yet um, that uh, at least widespread buy-in that this is a real disease um, with measurements that we can make that prove it. And, uh, and without that, without the science and proper clinical trials with tailored therapy, precision medicine, I don't think we're gonna to get to the phase where we're gonna have widespread acceptance of say a center for ME. Um, with multidisciplinary representation. So I think for now, the immediate need over the next, uh, there's lots of needs and I recognize the clinical side, believe me, but I think uh, for us to get the message out there, we need the medicine and the science uh, better defined and we need the funding for it. Okay, all great answers. Thank you very much. I um, apologize, I've kept everyone uh, for an extra 15 minutes. I'm gonna turn it over to Leah and uh, we'll close out. And my, my gratitude, thank you so much. Thanks, Phil. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's event. I hope it was time well spent. Um, we will um, be sending out a link to the video once we get that posted, and we'll also have a post-event survey, which if you can help us by filling that out, that would be great. Um, and thank you again for all the fantastic questions. Thank you to the panelists um, for all their thoughtful answers and their time spent with us. And thank you for, um, to Linda Tannenbaum for proposing this joint event. We are um, very happy that this went so well, and we hope we'll be able to inv invite you to more events in the future. Thank you. <laughs>